Sonic Advance 3 is the final chapter in the Sonic Advance trilogy, developed by Sonic Team and Dimps and released for the Game Boy Advance in late 2003. The game is notable for introducing the tag action mechanic, not too dissimilar from the team mechanic found in Sonic Heroes, released just a few months prior. Like the two handheld titles before it, Sonic Advance 3 again received generally favorable reviews. IGN scored the game a 9 out of 10, stating, Sega has tweaked and updated the game design with a significant amount of items that make each experience better than the last. GameSpot gave the game an 8.4 out of 10, noting, Sonic Advance 3 is a great, fast-paced platform game and the tag team play mechanic really enhances the overall experience. Finally, GameSpy scored the game 3 out of 5 stars, proclaiming, In the end, this is the best and most realized of of the Sonic Advance games, and definitely worth picking up if you enjoyed the first two. So has Sonic Advance 3 held up after nearly 14 years? Let's take a look. Sonic Advance 3 opens with Sonic and Tails racing towards the horizon. Then Dr. Eggman presses a button, triggering an explosion, presumably harnessing the power of the Master Emerald. After this, the player is presented with a unique character select, allowing them to choose both a character as well as a partner. Initially, only Sonic and Tails are available, making the choice easy. From here, the game shows some text advising Dr. Eggman wants to use the power of the Chaos Emeralds to build Eggman Land. This of course makes no sense with the game's text and cutscenes not matching. The manual, on the other hand, paints a completely different story. Dr. Eggman has used Chaos Control to break the world into seven parts. Sonic then needs to visit each of the seven parts, find the Chaos Emerald, rescue his friends, and then use Chaos Control to put the world back together. However, Dr. Eggman has created a new robot, Gemral, to try and thwart Sonic the Hedgehog. While fanciful, this is a much more cohesive plot, and I don't understand why the in-game text varies from the official documentation. Anyway, Sonic begins his adventure in Route 99, the first of the seven world parts. The designers also decided to implement hub worlds, which are sort of like the hubs in Kirby's Adventure. To enter the first act, one needs to jump into the appropriate act ring. Upon completion, the act ring will have a crown. After seeking out all three act rings and beating the stages, the boss becomes available. Beat the boss and the characters race through the rainbow abyss to the next part of the broken world to repeat the process. And yes, I did say there were three acts per zone. Sonic Advance 3 returns to the formula introduced in the original Sonic game, with three acts per zone instead of two. This means there are a whopping 21 stages to play through, making Sonic Advance 3 a much larger game than its predecessors. The seven zones are fairly creative, too. Route 99 is a city-style level, a theme which became popular during the Dreamcast era titles. Sunset Hill is a remix of Green Hill Zone from Sonic the Hedgehog, which was pretty rad at the time, though has been done to death at the present time. Ocean Base is a mix of an underwater theme and an industrial theme. Toy Kingdom is a mix of a circus and a carnival theme. Twinkle Snow is a snow or ice theme taking place at twilight. Cyber Track appears to be a second attempt at the cyberspace theme from Sonic Advance 2. Finally, Chaos Angel is an ancient rune. While perhaps not the most inventive themes ever found in a video game, by 2003 I'm not sure there were many new ideas to explore in the 2D platforming genre. The daylight changes in Sunset Hill and Twinkle Snow do an admirable job making the theme gimmicks feel fresh. As best as I can remember, Route 99 is the first true city theme in a 2D Sonic game. Ocean Bay and Chaos Angel are fresh takes on the underwater and ancient rune themes. This leaves just Toy Kingdom and Cybertrack having a sort of been there, done that feel to them. Level themes aside, the biggest change in Sonic Advance 3 are the controls and partner mechanic. I'll just start with Sonic and Tails since they are the initial characters available and an obvious place to begin. Sonic has access to most of his moves from the previous Advance games. He can spin dash, spins into a ball when jumping, and can skid attack into enemies. He can enter boost mode after running for a while and can perform mid-air tricks like in Sonic Advance 2. However, his homing attack is missing. In order to gain access to the homing attack, Sonic will need to partner with Cream. However, this will remove the mid-air tricks. The options between the five characters are exhausting and spans a whopping 10 pages of the instruction manual. The additions and subtractions are fascinating and some make more sense than others. 
While the boost mode was prominent in Sonic Advance 2, it's only available when Sonic is the player character or partner character in Sonic Advance 3. This represents a sort of speed mode, as shown in the upper left hand corner. There is also a fly mode and a power mode, mimicking the formations found in Sonic Heroes. Sorta. One could spend hours exploring all of these additions and subtractions, but it hardly impacts the overall game. The footage in this video is from my fourth playthrough of the game, and I just stuck with the classic Sonic and Tails combo for simplicity's sake. And only Sonic can unlock the extra characters. Knuckles, Amy, and Cream are all unlocked after beating the third act of Zone 2, 4, and 6, respectively. But only if Sonic is the lead character. On a non-recorded run, I did a playthrough with Tails and was confused why new characters weren't being unlocked. It's an odd game decision and puts a strange and unnecessary restriction on the partner system. The addition and subtraction elements are not the only thing the partner system adds, however. Two additional moves are added to each character's arsenal. Tag actions. Holding the right bumper will summon the partner character. Once charged up on the ground, Tails will launch Sonic high into the air, allowing for some cool shortcuts. Even better, using the tag action in midair will have Tails fly, carrying Sonic with them. It might not seem like much, but as a gamer who grew up playing Sonic the Hedgehog 2, it sort of blew my mind having Tails actually be useful instead of a wasted opportunity. I personally found it an awesome addition, allowing Sonic to reach areas not normally accessible. Other tag actions are interesting as well, like Sonic launching Tails into an instant boost, or Cream launching Knuckles like a projectile, but adding flight to Sonic's moveset is easily one of the coolest things I've experienced in a side-scrolling Sonic game. With the controls and levels out of the way, let's move on to the bosses. Occasionally, the player will have a battle against Eggman's robot Jamro. These are fairly straightforward, with the player needing to dodge an increasing amount of attacks while getting in for hits. However, each of the seven zones concludes with a proper boss fight against Eggman. The Route 99 fight is a basic egg hammer style encounter. Eggman alternates hammering the left and right hand side of the screen, requiring the player to move out of the way and strike the cockpit. The Sunset Hill fight is against a giant rotating ball. As the weak point is only visible at certain points of the rotation, a little anticipation is required to get in hits. Ocean Base features a jumping style boss. The player just needs to stop between the legs and then jump at the cockpit to register hits. The boss fight in Toy Kingdom might be the most unique found in the trilogy, with Eggman sporting a jack-in-the-box creation. Different attacks will sprout from the top to surprise the player. After dodging the attacks, Eggman will show himself and then it's time to strike, pushing the box farther across the screen with the goal being to knock it over the edge. I like this alternate win condition. Twinkle Snow's boss is a platforming gauntlet. Unlike the previous bosses, the players require to defeat this one perfectly, as the fight is over a bottomless pit. The goal is to jump on the platforms which will then collapse, get them to fall into Eggman to register a hit. This is simple enough, but Eggman's mace attack is tough to avoid, and will almost certainly cause death as the character gets knocked back into the pit. This is marginally easier with a flying character, but is still the hardest part of the entire game. Cybertrack has a unique boss where Eggman launches projectiles at the player. The player then needs to attack the projectile so it changes color and hopefully ricochets into Eggman causing damage. Lastly, Chaos Angel has another interesting encounter featuring reverse gravity. The player needs to attack Gemro and then get out of the way so the unstable platform doesn't launch the character into a hazard. Eggman will also rotate wildly from side to side, forcing the player to jump over him to dodge the attack. I actually found this challenging at first, but once one gets the patterns down, the fight is straightforward. So, with the 21 acts completed and the 7 bosses defeated, it's time for the final boss. This is a two-part affair, first against Gemro's final form, after he's learned all of the moves or upgraded or something, and then a fight against Eggman. The Eggman fight is decent, requiring the player to dodge the giant mech's fists while using them as platforms to hit the cockpit. The fists will also play Pong, giving the player another set of platforms to reach the cockpit. Alternatively, Tails pretty much breaks this boss boss, being able to land hits with relative ease thanks to flight. With the mech defeated, a final cutscene play showing the character giving Eggman one final hit and Gemral chasing behind. From here, the Master Emerald gives off a burst of energy 
presumably joining the world back together, then the sky turns blue, signifying the end of the adventure. With peace restored to the world, the adventure is over, and the credits roll. Graphically, Sonic Advance 3 is an amazing looking game. The backgrounds have received a dramatic upgrade over its predecessors, filled with multiple layers of scrolling like the clouds and buildings of Route 99, the trees in Sunset Hill, the machinery in Ocean Base, the balloons into a kingdom, the static in Cybertrack, and the columns of Chaos Angel. If that weren't enough, there are line scrolling effects giving a rippling effect in the water of Route 99 and Ocean Base, as well as the northern lights in Twinkle Snow. The rest of the level sprite work is great as well. Details on the edges of platforms vary from the insides, making the overall structure make a lot more sense and helping to prevent the different acts from feeling like a sea of repeating tiles over bland backgrounds. When combined with the top-notch animation, which remains some of my favorite 2D Sonic art thanks to the abundance of animation frames and clever rotation effects over round and angled surfaces, Sonic Advance 3 delivers a visually impressive experience holding up just as well in 2017 as it did in 2003. I can say the same for the audio presentation. While the previous installments leaned heavily on techno and electronica for the majority of the adventures, Sonic Advance 3 really expands things in terms of pacing, instrument selections, and musical genres. This could also be why I enjoyed the level theme so much. Each has a fitting piece of music helping them feel distinct from each other, as well as different enough from previous games to not feel rehashed. Even better, each act has a slightly different version of the zone song. This could be different instrument arrangements, different tempos, or other alterations. It's not much, but goes a long way since each zone does have three acts. There's also plenty of voice acting, most notably during the Eggman fights. The cutscenes are still taxed, but I love hearing the late Dean Bristow shout out, You are going to pay for this at the conclusion of each encounter. It's a small touch, but it's the little things like this that go a long way towards helping a game feel polished. So, with all of that out of the way, we arrive back to the question asked at the beginning of the video. Has Sonic Advance 3 held up after nearly 14 years? First, let me start with some of the positives, like how enemies drop a ring when defeated. It seems like a pointless addition to the game, but generally speaking, defeating enemies has provided little outside of a minor score boost in past titles, and rewarding a ring, where 100 earns the player an extra life, is a nice little bonus. A much bigger deal is the overall structure of the game. Dating back to 1998's Sonic Adventure, Sonic Team seemed hell-bent on making the player repeat stages multiple times in order to unlock the true ending of the game. In Sonic Adventure, Tails repeats many of Sonic's levels, and the Amy, Big, and Gamma campaigns lack the same quality as the main trio. Sonic Adventure 2 handled this a little better, with just two campaigns needing to be completed in order to unlock the final stage. Even better, different playstyles and set pieces were mixed up for the two campaigns, keeping things fresh. Still, many Sonic fans like yours truly didn't particularly enjoy the treasure hunting sequences, making a large section of the game a major grind. Sonic Heroes, on the other hand, forced the player to play through the game four times with the four different teams, with the only difference being the length of the adventure, the difficulty of the enemies, and Team Chaotic's alternate goals. Sonic Advance 2 followed a similar pattern, forcing the player to beat the game with each character in order to unlock the final boss. In Sonic Advance 3, however, one just needs to beat the game once, which is terrific. Of course, one still needs to nab the seven Chaos Emeralds. Hidden in each of the 21 acts, along with some of the hub worlds, are Chao. There are 10 per zone, so 70 needed in total. Even better, once one is nabbed, the player retains it. The player can quit the stage, get a game over, whatever. Unless the save data is cleared, the Chao never has to be collected again, which is awesome. Even better, the Sonic Factory will show the player how many Chao are hidden in each act, so they can quickly determine which acts to visit to find the remaining Chao. Collecting 10 Chao 
Chao will not reward the zone's Chaos Emerald, however. Once the 10 Chao have been collected, the player will need to locate a key and then beat the current act. From here, they can travel to the special stage Spring hidden in the hub world, which will launch them to the special stage. The special stages are a nod to Sega's superscalar games of the 1980s, using sprite scaling to give the illusion of 3D space. The player is tasked with collecting a specific number of rings before reaching a checkpoint, and then a second ring goal will be added for the player to try and reach. Meet both goals and the Chaos Emerald is obtained. Fail, and the player will need to travel back to a stage, find a key, beat the level, before getting another attempt. The first five special stages are not challenging, and I beat most of these on my first try with little effort. The sixth and seventh stage, on the other hand, are incredibly difficult. Both of these took me a few hours to finally beat, and I didn't really experience much joy on either one. Memorization rather than reflexes are needed to be successful. Knowing where all of the rings are and the locations of the enemies are a precursor to success, making the key requirement seem unfair. I also find the whole superscalar formula doesn't really work for this playstyle. It's difficult to tell when something is close to the character, meaning snatching rings can be awkward, and hitting enemies happens frequently even though it appears the character is out of harm's way. Even worse, the final special stage requires the player to smash enemies, which rewards a cool five rings. As best as I can tell, outside of perfect play, hitting enemies will be a requirement to reach the absurd ring goals here, and hitting enemies is a clumsy the experience. With every jump, I was hoping I was going to hit the enemy instead of landing and then flying into it. Needless to say, it took me longer to beat the seventh special stage than it did to beat the game, making collecting the seven Chaos Emeralds in Sonic 3 one of the worst Emerald quests I've played in a Sonic game. However, the Chow collecting was fine. In fact, this encourages the player to experiment with different character combinations, which I like. Having Sonic tag action Tails into boost mode is needed to grab this Chow in Sunset Hill. Knuckles is needed to traverse this tall corridor in Ocean Base, and the power formation is needed to break through these walls in Toy Kingdom. I also discovered Cream retains the broken cheese attack when partnered with Knuckles. Cheese will home in on enemies and bosses, as well as rotate around Cream, forming a shield. Discovering tricks and elements like this is awesome, and Sonic 3 does a terrific job offering the player moments of discovery. So, after finding the seven Chao, locating seven keys, and beating the seven specials, stages to obtain the seven Chaos Emeralds, the player can finally make their way to the true final boss and see the real ending. Much like unlocking new characters, the player first must choose Sonic to actually reach the final boss. First, the player needs to replay the final stage and defeat Eggman. From here, the ending cutscene changes, having Gemeral smash into Sonic who then drops the seven Chaos Emeralds. Gemeral then transforms into a robot and betrays Eggman, drops the Chaos Emeralds, and disappears. Sonic goes super, Eggman follows and the true final boss is presented. Super Sonic and Eggman form a team called Non-Aggression. The player needs to utilize the tag action to charge up Eggman as a projectile and then strike Gemeral. This will reveal the boss's weak point so Super Sonic can attack it. It's honestly one of the easiest space bosses found in a Sonic game and can be defeated with minimal effort or skill. Still, after those special stages, I'm not going to complain. The final cutscene shows Cream and her mother befriending Gemeral, presumably turning him good or something. It is cool enough, I suppose, and cements Cream's status as most charming character in the Sonic universe. One of the biggest changes in Sonic Advance 3 is the reduced focus on speed and the rebalancing of the Sonic formula. Depending on the character and partner selected, the boost mode and trick system might not even be available to the player. Instead, Sonic Advance 3 features plenty of platforming. This is minimal at first, with Route 99 acts not requiring too many precision jumps, but Sunset Hill adds a few moving platforms over a bottomless pit. Ocean Base continues the formula with more tricky jumps, and this pattern continues all the way to Chaos Angel Act 3, which is a two and a half minute platforming marathon along a moving platform over a bottomless pit. In fact, this is probably the best aspect of Sonic Advance 3. The difficulty progression from beginning to end is nearly perfect. Each stage 
isn't just a jaunt from left to right, but rather loops around, left and right, up and down, with plenty of hazards and obstacles forcing the player to utilize their platforming skills to progress. For those preferring lots of jumps in their Sonic game, Sonic Advance 3 absolutely delivers. This segues right to my biggest gripe with Sonic Advance 3. Sonic controls like crap. At their core, platformers are about platforming, meaning the only two ingredients necessary for a great experience are interesting levels to traverse through and tight controls matching the tasks and challenges presented to the player. Unfortunately, Sonic Advance 3 stumbles in this basic area. Sonic controls have been tweaked, increasing his momentum. It is needlessly difficult to make mid-air adjustments for landing, and Sonic takes longer than necessary to come to a halt. While it's difficult to convey feel in written and video form, I can tell you I would often be forced to lightly tap the D-pad to make adjustments, would be forced to press left and right in mid-air to try and land jumps, and found myself overshooting almost every jump the game provides. Sonic is just insanely slippery, and as the previous entries in the Advanced series didn't feature this abundance of momentum, I can't help but fall the designers for changing something that wasn't broken to begin with. I suspect the changes were made to give more of a difference between the game's five playable characters. Cream, for example, doesn't feature these issues. Her momentum feels perfect, making slight adjustments easy and the jumping exceptionally fluid. Now, one could argue if one doesn't like Sonic's unique control attributes, they could just select a different character and partner, but Sonic is necessary for unlocking better handling characters in the first place, and is required to beat the game and see the extra zone and true ending. Making Sonic's slippery behavior even worse is some of the most obnoxious enemy and hazard placement I've played in a platformer in quite some time. Enemies are always waiting to damage the player as soon as they land a jump. Spike placement is simply awful, with a natural forward progression leading to plenty of damage and a loss of rings due to no fault of the player. The crushing is obnoxious as well. First, it's programmed poorly, so characters will get crushed even if they aren't in the danger zone. Second, the placement is terrible, much like the spikes. While I can get over spike damage since the ring system mitigates these cheap moments, rings don't mitigate death. And since the player will rarely collect 100 rings in the first place, I experience the game over screen more frequently in Sonic Advance 3 than any other Sonic game to date. To be fair, one could play one of the two minigames in each of the seven hub worlds to try and farm lives, but these get progressively harder as the adventure wears on, limiting their usefulness. Eagle-eyed viewers will notice my life stack is generally fairly low in this recorded run. The last issue I have is with the bosses. Not so much in their design, because I don't really have an issue with any of them, except Twinkle Snow. That boss sucks, but rather their random nature. Most of the movements and attacks in the bosses are random, meaning the time it takes the player to beat the boss or the level of challenge provided will be completely up to chance. Sometimes the boss of Zone 2 will hover back and forth, allowing ample opportunities to strike. Other times he hangs out in the edges of the screen, making things more time consuming. Sometimes the boss of Ocean Base will always leave his feet outward, leading to a quick and easy fight. Other times he bends them inwards, denying the player an opportunity to strike. The Jack in the Box is the worst offender, with the missiles and ball and chain attack requiring different strategies for success, resulting in the player taking plenty of hits when preemptively preparing for the wrong one, because there is no pattern. Same goes for the Zone 6 boss. Depending on when Eggman fires, the player will either have an easy path to victory or a long drawn out battle spanning a few minutes. The final boss is the same way. His punching attack is brutal and it's not clear to me how to avoid it. His grabbing attack is tough to dodge, though not impossible. The player's chances of success depend solely on the frequency of these two attacks. If Eggman uses them sparingly, the fight is easy. If not, expect a few deaths. Success in the boss battles seems to come down to luck and random chance rather than skill, hardly a hallmark of good boss design. Even with the negatives, it is easy to see why many fans declare Sonic Advance 3 to be their favorite of the trilogy. For my money, the level design, not counting enemies and hazards, is probably the best in the trilogy, testing the platforming skills of the player with a wide variety of jumps and pattern recognition in order to progress. The quality never falters either, with the final zones displaying a similar quality level as the first. There is no Metropolis Zone surprise where it seems the designers ran out of time. 
time. The difficulty progression of the axe is equally impressive, with a nice curve ranging from easy at the beginning of the game to challenging at the end. Same goes with the length of the stages, starting off in the sub 2 minute range and then slowly expanding to the 5 minute mark near the end of the game. The added time isn't due to padding either, but rather more challenging levels, which is nice. And at times, Sonic Advance 3 features a high level of polish, with a more diverse selection of music tracks, much better tiles used for the set pieces resulting in less bland areas, and some of the best animation found in the series. The partner system is well executed, mostly, adding a semblance of balance to the teams by removing and adding certain attacks and abilities. And the tag actions are fantastic, and I'll be forever disappointed when my boy Tails is not able to lift Sonic to a new platform. Some of the gameplay tweaks are excellent, like enemies dropping rings, gathered chow being saved by the game, and a less tedious entry into the special stages. But what holds me back from declaring this game great is how Sonic Advance 3 falters at the basics. There was no reason to change Sonic's momentum and make him slippery. And this can't be avoided either, with the player being forced to lead with Sonic in order to unlock new characters, as well as play through the extra boss. An experienced player could skip Sonic Sonic and just play him on the three acts and final boss, but a new player has no way to know this. But still, there was no reason for Dimps to make Sonic control more like Bubsy or Zool, when Sonic's tight controls are the one thing from the original games most can agree were terrific in the first place. This step backwards is just baffling to me. But what really knocks the game down for me are the surprise enemies and spikes. Even on my fourth playthrough, where I would actively avoid surprise prizes based on memory, I was still getting hit on a relatively frequent basis. So much so that on the 21 axe, I only managed to grab 100 rings three or four times. Compared to the previous game where I was rocking beyond nine lives for a majority of the game, it is clear to me the designers took a giant step backwards in terms of fair challenge. At the end of the day, Sonic 3 is a fine title, and despite its warts, the game is still better than the dearth of average and mediocre platformers flooding the system, but after beating it numerous times, I don't feel compelled to revisit this one. The constant barrage of cheap hits, the awful special stages, the random boss attacks, and slippery controls make this one a tiring endeavor. If you're a fan of Sonic games, Advance 3 is an easy one to recommend. If you're a fan of platformers, Advance 3 is worth a look, just don't bother with the Chaos Emeralds.